Today we're in the garage to replace the oil cooler, aka oil filter housing, and the spark plugs in my 21 Wrangler Rubicon with the 3.6. Now I'm not replacing the oil cooler because I've got a leaking problem, which is common. I'm replacing it because it's only $150 for the newest design that came out in fall of 23, where they changed the design of the seals. Uh, I'll show you towards the end of the video what they did and why I felt it was a wise decision. It's only a little bit more work to change out the oil cooler, so it made sense. Uh, but that said, let's get into it. Remove the two push pins. There's one here and one back here behind the sensor. This one's especially difficult. You're going to need a finite, small, flat tip screwdriver. This piece will pull out first. Now you need to remove the EGR tube retaining bolt. It's actually stud mounted, so just take the nut off. Next you're going to remove this one and this one. 
disconnect the wiring harness from the upper intake manifold here. And there's another one back here. Now we're working on the eight intake bolts. They are eight millimeter. Spin the tab slightly outward. Remove the clip. Fuel line will be pressurized. I'm going to try to skip that step. Depressurize it. Oh, that wasn't too bad. You just push this button in, thoroughly push it in, and pull. Now this Jeep has been setting for probably about 10 hours. So maybe some of the pressure bled back to the fuel tank. So keep that in mind. Maybe let it set for a long time. Now disconnect fuel injector wiring harnesses pulling up on the red clips. Sorry. Gently. Now remove the push pins that are holding the fuel injector wiring harness on. Now we're going to clean around the ports. I did use a vacuum first because there was some mud up in there, but uh, now I'm going to Take a damp cloth and wipe away from the ports and just clean up this area. Next, after removing the lower intake, you need to disconnect this oil pressure sensor. So you'll pop the white clip up and then you'll need to try to get a pick in there and squeeze it. Or the alternative is to go ahead and remove the oil cooler and tilt it upwards towards the hood and see if you can get at it from that angle. Next you're going to remove this coolant hose right here. You're going to have to compress this clamp and it might take some effort to get this off the back. If you want you can buy a hose crimper as a special tool that just compresses the hose and keeps it from leaking so much fluid out. I ended up using needle nose vice grips to hold it in place. Hopefully when I unbolt it, the hose will slide off. All right, I just figured it out. My clip side where I needed to push in to release the connector was facing the coolant hose. So I couldn't get in there and um, the cheap pick I had kept spinning inside the handle. So I decided to turn the whole sensor with a 24 millimeter wrench. Seems like it fits good and it wasn't that tight. So I am now able to reach it as it's pointing upwards. All right, there's the oil cooler oil filter housing. I did break the connector, but nowadays there's no way that I'm going to cut and splice anything as sensitive as these electronics are. This is still serviceable. I've done this on coil pack connectors before, but right here, this is a pathway. I do want to note that these are special zip ties. These are rated to 248 degrees. Um, most of your Common zip ties are going to be rated to 185 from my findings looking at the packaging. Um, I found these at Home Depot and uh, they are um, rated for automotive use. I just wanted to give you a better view of what fix I've come up with that I've used in the past. Uh, again, using these high temperature 248 degree rated zip ties. I have found a neck down portion right here where, the, where it threads into the housing. It'll sit down in there when everything's cinched up. This is the one that's going to go and come back like this. It's going to go through what's left of the locking tab 
there's a little pathway in there and it's still present and just for some redundancy what I've done here I'm going to do it on the back side too because again I'm going to have a zip tie around the minimum diameter here and one on the other side of the connector and what it's going to do is bridge this gap right here and cinch it together. Just a little bit more. Alright, just to get this, make sure it's completely tight. Alright. Okay, so per the manual, I have tightened all of the oil cooler filter housing bolts. There's five of them finger tight and I used a purple thread locker it's a, a little weaker than medium strength um, just to keep it from backing out the next step is setting your inch pound torque wrench to 108 inch pounds or nine foot pounds and there's a specific sequence there's one up here by the oil filter there's one and then back driver side that's two front driver side is three back passenger side four and right in front of the fins here Let's see that change the angle a little bit that's five right down in there and if you see a wiring harness connector that has this square shaped bracket on it it's made of plastic it actually slides over the back tab of this lower intake and is retained in place by a push pin after connecting the coolant line and the oil pressure sender switch at the back of the lower intake manifold I've started the eight lower intake manifold bolts by hand you are going into the cylinder head and you do not want to cross thread those so start them by hand and then I used a small ratchet to tighten them up just enough to where they make contact with the lower intake manifold after that the next step is to torque them to 108 inch pounds or 9 foot pounds and here's the sequence that you're going to need to follow Now I will point out that you need to go over this twice because I observed some movement in the bolts after I went through the torque sequence again. So yeah, just to make sure that they're all properly torqued, especially uh, being so hard to get to, I would definitely uh, go over them with a torque wrench one more time in sequence. Now you can reconnect all of the injector wiring harnesses, of course there's six. Reconnect your fuel line to the fuel rail. It snaps in place and then reinstall your blue clip. Since I'm approaching 100,000 miles, I'm going to go ahead and pause with the intake installation at this moment and move forward with replacing the spark plugs. 
So the next step is to disconnect the wiring harness from the coil packs. Just go back, use a flat tip screwdriver, gently push until they pop off here. Now we're going to push down on the clip here and come in under this black part here with a pick, tie it up just a little and they'll come right off. It doesn't say anything about this in the service manual for whatever reason, but uh, I would have had to take this bracket off to get this coil out. So as an alternative to doing that, I have cut the bracket here. You see it's still rigid. It's just here to support these lines and the upper intake manifold. I've also notched these holes for the upper plenum studs that are also a little difficult to get out. Um, it won't sacrifice any strength. Now remove the six coil pack bolts. They do come all the way out, so be ready to catch them. The next step is removing the coils. And in the service manual, they recommend giving it a slight twist with a firm pull. They say if it's too difficult to get out, then they recommend replacing the boots. That wasn't too bad. Now we're just going to look down all six spark plug tubes to see if we see any signs of tube seal leakage, you know, where oil might be in the bottom there. I've looked at all six. They look great. Now, even though all of these seals right here, you can see where the dirt stops, they, have, they all look the same. They've all kept the dirt out of the spark plug tubes. I'm going to follow the service manual's recommendation on using compressed air to blow out all of the spark plug tubes. <laughs> And the reason you're doing that is to make sure that there's no debris or dirt that falls into the cylinder when you remove the spark plug because you don't want anything to fall down in there and score your cylinder walls which lessens your ring seal. Now that I've blown out all of the spark plug tubes to make sure there's no debris in there, I don't want to forget that there is some right up here on this lip. So I'm going to take those inside and wipe those down and make sure that nothing else falls down into the spark plug tubes. The next step is to remove the spark plug. The next step is to install the new spark plug. You want to make sure you don't hit the ground strap and mess up your gap. We're going to start it by hand, gently set it down in there. Now I do want to take a second and point out that these NGK plugs have a special metal coating on the threads. They do not require anti-seize. And another thing, always check your plug gaps. I prefer to use flat feeler gauges and just slide it between the electrode and the ground strap to make sure that it's correct. Uh, these were off. They were too closed up and I had to open these about one thousandth at least to get to the spec of 43. The next step is to torque the spark plugs to 180 inch pounds or 15 foot pounds. Nice smooth movement until you get a click. You're going to feel a little resistance that is the gasket compressing. And that's it. The next step in the service manual is to apply Mopar Mollycoat 5008. It's a synthetic 
dielectric grease and they want you to put it about a sixteenth of an inch past the chamfer here in the boot so I've just uh, I've actually made up my own concoction because I don't have it and then I guess it's like forty dollars a tube so I have Permatex dielectric grease and after doing some reading up on um, the Mopar grease uh, as the silicone burns off it leaves behind a polymer that helps the boot release after so many heat cycles. Um, so I've kind of come up with my own concoction of Permatex dielectric grease and I have a polymer based 500 degree stable bearing grease. It's called green grease and it's fully synthetic. So uh, right or wrong, uh, I'm going to put some of this mixture in there and it just so happens to be the same light green color that the Mopar lubricant is and they don't want it on the outer edge if you get it on there wipe it off just about a sixteenth of an inch in you'll actually see a raised rib edge there and you just need a very thin film now I'll reconnect the coil packs it clicks push the white clip down and it's locked in place the next step is to torque the coil bolts to 71 inch pounds now we're going to begin to reinstall the upper intake plenum the first step is to Put back the insulation there. Now remove the tape from your intake ports here. Before we lower the upper intake onto the lower, I want to point out this bracket here. Uh, these are studs, both of these coming off of the upper intake plenum. They need to go into the hole here, so you're going to come from passenger side over to the, the driver's side and then let it down. Unless you've notched the bracket like I have here. Now it's time to set down your upper plenum onto the lower. And there will be two locating tabs on the front and the back to help line everything up. Make sure that your bolts are in the upward position. If you thread them out far enough, they will hold in place. Then snug them down until they touch, and then you will torque them to 89 inch pounds. Here's the torque sequence. And like with the lower, I would go through this torque sequence twice. And reinstall that nut and tighten it to 84 inch pounds. Same for this one, 84 inch pounds. EGR tube. Start with this one, just a little tip. And what you can do is reach your fingers under it and over it to turn it and get it started while you kind of hold it in place. Once you get it started, you come over here, start this one. And then what I did was I used a long extension to come way back over here and used uh, a small torque wrench. And I set it to 84 inch pounds for both of these. Reinstall your EGR sensor connector. Don't forget to, to lock your white clip there after you've got it connected. Brake booster hose, make sure you push that all the way on. You can kind of use this twisting motion, makes it easier. Reinstall your attachment points for the throttle body wire there. I broke the originals getting them off, both of them. So I just zip tied it to the casting on both of these. Then reconnect your throttle body. 
and don't forget to lock your red clip there. Next you're going to take this wiring harness tube and push the push pin back in there. There's one on the rear as well. Reconnect your map sensor. All right, so this is your makeup air tube. Put it in the lower C channel there. Now reinstall your transmission vent hose. Reinstall your evaporative purge solenoid on the upper intake. Now reconnect the connector here. Now just reconnect your vapor purge line by pushing and reinstall your lock clips. Just like that. Now reconnect your PCV hose to the upper intake. Now we just need to reinstall the intake tube, which Mopar calls the resonator. I have went ahead and added some coolant to offset what I'd lost. I filled it up to the max line here, and it's just been uh, slowly going down a little bit. What you're going to need to do is fill it up to the max, run it all the way up to temperature, let the engine cool down and it will suck some down into it and then just keep re-topping it off as the level goes down when it stops you know you're full There's the locating tab right here. Let's make sure that lines up. Make sure it's on all the way underneath. That looks good. Looks good down here. <laughs> yes, I looked it up. 35 inch pounds. You know, it, it's made of plastic. You don't want to distort it. And these bolts right here are 27 inch pounds. Reconnect your makeup air hose. Reinstall your wiring harness retainer clips for your intake air temperature sensor and then reconnect your intake air temperature sensor. Now it's time to reconnect your negative battery cables. And yep, I looked that up to 53 inch pounds. Yeah, you don't want to replace these down the road. At least any sooner than you have to. It's kind of a pain. And not as reliable as factory. Now I'm just going to change the oil just in case any coolant got down into the oil passages. I will say, if you take the oil cooler off, you'll see what I'm talking about. All of the oil passages, the one in the center of the block and the two at the front, are significantly higher than that of the valley below it and the coolant passages that are there. So I'm not going to say nothing got in there when you're pulling the oil cooler out, but I'm going to just go ahead and do an oil change just in case to be safe. And since it's been a few days since I started this and all of the oil has drained down into the oil pan, when I do the oil change and I go to start it, one little tip is you can hold your foot on the brake 
put your foot all the way down on the gas at the same time and hit start and it will crank until you hit start again that's just to get the oil flowing into the oil pump and started into the engine oil passages so i just installed the fourth generation of the 3.6 oil cooler slash oil filter housing and i'm going to show you the differences between the last generation and this one You can see here the old one out of my 21 Wrangler has oil and coolant passages that share the same figure 8 gasket. Here's where the failure point is under the cooler. The gasket common wall fills right here when it deteriorates and deforms allowing coolant and oil to mix. The fourth generation I installed looks like this. And based on my experience, it looks to be a wise move to give the passages separate gaskets that are then reinforced with a dividing wall you see here. I think it should have been this way from the outset. The fourth generation came out in fall of 23 per Benny at allmoparparts.com. So I'm not sure if they did a mid-year oil cooler change on the 23 Wrangler and Gladiator 3.6s or not. I would think the 24s should have it, but rather than guess, you can give your VIN number to Benny that you can message at jlwranglerforums.com, a vendor there, or reach out to your preferred Mopar parts dealer to see if your Wrangler, Gladiator, or any Jeep with a 3.6 has the fourth generation oil cooler. I'll share a list of the tools you'll need for the job to see if you want to tackle the oil cooler and spark plug swap yourself at the end of the video.